Uh, good morning, and I would like to welcome members to the second meeting in 2018 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Our first item today is for the committee to take evidence on one proposed cross-party group. The group we have to consider today is the proposed cross-party group on shared parenting, and I'd like to welcome Ivan McKee, MSP, to the meeting. Ivan is the co-convener of the group, and I'd like to invite you, Ivan, to make an opening statement about the purpose of the group. Thank you very much for inviting me along this morning to talk to the committee. Um, the intent is to set up a cross-party group on shared parenting, and there are two main purposes, two main objectives we want to, or areas we want to cover there. Uh, the first is to do with the issue of gender stereotyping, which is clearly an issue that uh, pervades society in, in many manifestations. And we see in the area of parenting um, assumptions around about, um, about gender stereotyping, which uh, we think are, uh, are not helpful. And we see that's part of a wider um, wider uh, gender stereotyping across, across society. So I think by exploring that, understanding that a bit better, it puts us in a better position to make some make some progress in that part of the the agenda um, and the second area is that um, th there's academic research that shows that children that spend time with both parents post uh, post separation or divorce um, do better uh, in, th in their life chances so we see this as very much feeding into the uh, agenda of closing the attainment gap um, which we, we, we think can be a very positive contribution there but also again children that uh, they see both parents after separation um, Again, that, uh, that that helps challenge gender stereotypes at that uh, that very impressionable age. So we see that as very positive as well. The group has had its first uh, initial meeting, and I've been very um, encouraged and uh, surprised by the amount of um, interest that has been both from organisations and from uh, individuals. Um, you'll see from the documentation that we have um, cross-party uh, MSP um, participation in the in the group, and we've got those about a dozen organisations that were uh, expressed an interest or managed to get along to the, the first meeting. Um, so um, we're, we're at that situation. We'd like the, the committee to approve the group so that we can move forward. Part of the work programme will be to um, explore research into the area and understand um, what, what, what the, the, the situation with research is, to invite speakers along. Um, there are many... Um, other countries, particularly Scandinavia and some US states that are, that are much further advanced in this area than, uh, than Scotland and would like to learn from, from their experiences. So international um, speakers, I think, could contribute, contribute greatly to that. Um, and we're very um, open to any suggestions of other uh, external groups that uh, anybody thinks should participate in, uh, in the CPG because we want to involve as many people as possible in, um, in the group. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Um, I'll open it up for members to ask questions. Alexander. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Ivan. I think there's a great cross-section of support you've got here from organisations as well as individuals. Uh, so when you're planning to progress it, uh, is it your intention to, to specifically look at individual topics uh, to try and hone in on some of the research that you've indicated has come from other parts of the world? Yeah, for sure. And if you look at, we give some indication of what we'd want to, uh, what we'd want to consider there. So some of that will bring in people who have uh, experienced at a senior level in, um, in the court system, in the legal system. Uh, other areas of focus could be exploring the research in more detail and bring in people, academics that have done work there. Another area could be, as I said, to bring in um, speakers or people that have got experience in how, um, how shared parenting operates in other countries and what, uh, what we can learn from that. Good. Thank you. Elaine? Thanks, convener. Morning, Ivan. Morning. Um, yeah, just in, in reading what, what you've put in, I wondered if um, where you say that you're going to talk to young people who've experienced uh, shared parenting and also consider shared parenting situations where there isn't conflict sure. as role models of best practice, would you also envisage looking at the situations an experience of young people where there has been conflict? To oh, see? yeah, yeah. And I think the reason that was in there is because... There is, um, there is a, some, sometimes an assumption that when you start talking about this area, you, start, you, you, you end up looking at the situation so there has been conflict and members of the group felt it was very important that we looked at outcomes in, in, in the round because obviously in many, many cases there isn't conflict and those often don't get, don't get profile. Um, but we're, uh, we're, we're keen to talk to and engage with groups that have um, experience in situations where there is unfortunately conflict and understand that. I mean, I've met myself with uh, Scottish Women's Aid prior to the setting up of the group to take their uh, perspective on it and have a discussion with them. Um, they don't want to join the group at this stage, but are a very 
constructive and fruitful discussion about their perspective on the unfortunately number of cases where uh, we are um, well, more than conflict where there is domestic abuse. Do you think organisations that you do have on maybe like the SPAC would assist with that? Well, absolutely and as I say or other, we're very open to invite other organisations and there was a discussion about that but who else should be, should be included. Um, and um, I think you've got Engender coming in later. That was one of the organisations that we, um, we we plan to approach to see if they would be interested because they've clearly got a perspective on gender stereotyping, which we think could be could be very helpful. So we're very keen to widen out the perspective as broadly as possible. And could I just ask a further question, Convener? Would you also be... You talk about gender stereotyping mm -hmm. and the roles of mothers and fathers, but um, obviously um, in society today, we do have different family situations. Yep. So you may have... Um, same-sex parents mm -hmm. in the situation. Yeah. So, would you also be including, you know, you're talking specifically mm -hmm. mothers and fathers? But no, that's a very good point, actually, and it's. Um, I think um, I'll take that point back to the group. I think we'd be more than delighted to do that. Um, I think at the initial meeting that didn't didn't get raised, but it's something that we, we should include, and I would probably want to expand, or um, I think the group would want to expand to make sure that we do have a session that specifically looks at. Uh, um, same-sex couples and the situation there um, post uh, post separation. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kavina. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much for coming along today, Ivan. Um, the committee will consider whether to approve the cross-party group agenda item three, and we'll inform you of the outcome of that discussion. And Thank you I very much. Will, uh, suspend uh, f shortly for a, a change order of witnesses. Thanks. Our next agenda item is an evidence session on the committee's inquiry into sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct. Joining us today are Cheryl Gedling, Industrial Officer, PCS Union, Katie Matheson, Coordinator of Scottish Women's Rights Centre, Davy Thompson, Campaign Director of White Ribbon Scotland, and Emma Trottier, a Policy and Parliamentary Manager for Engender. Um, we're not asking any of you to make a, an opening <coughs> statement, so if it's all right with the panel, we'll start directly with questions. And can I ask the, the panel what the, the common barriers are that discourage those experiencing sexual harassment to come forward to report the harassment? And what about those who witness harassment taking place? Who'd like to start? Um, so, in gender submitted our uh, written evidence, I'm just going to highlight what we had um, said were the barriers. One, I think, is the existing procedures or the policies are spread across multiple documents. So, when I was trying to sort out what the procedure was for reporting, investigating, um, and sanctioning sexual harassment or inappropriate behavior, I really struggled in finding out uh, where to go to find that information. And then once I had found it, it still wasn't clear to me where 
or who I was supposed to report it to. Um, so it seemed it was very dependent on who the person was, the perpetrator, and where the action uh, occurred. So it was very confusing to me to sort out what I would need to do if I was um, sexually harassed. I think the other um, barrier is um, the lack of clarity around confidentiality. So how is that information and personal information protected during reporting um, and then into the investigation? And then finally, I think another barrier is that it's not clear what the sanctions would be for the person who committed or for the perpetrator of sexual harassment. And I think that can be a real disincentive for individuals coming forward to report that kind of behavior, not knowing what the penalty will be um, and not having the assurance that there will be a penalty. So I think those are, those are a few of the barriers. Davey? Just carrying on from that. Um, I acknowledge everything that's already been said, but uh, just like yourself, it was, it's quite difficult to work out what people should do, but to a degree that's understandable because of the number of variations that you have that could come about in terms of whether it's uh, somebody working for an MSP that's wanting to report, somebody who's working elsewhere in the parliament, somebody who's visiting, somebody who's here you know, as, as a contractor or whatever. There's either, you know, whether they've got that role as, as the person being uh, harassed or is actually a perpetrator of it. And it makes it look a very complicated process to work out what should be done and when. Um, I think the, the answer to that is that the... the Difficult bit should be for organising how things get dealt with rather than for seeing where somebody who's wanting to report it fits in. For them, that should be quite straightforward. They should be able to go to a document which clearly says, well, this is your position. You're somebody visiting the parliament and you feel you've been harassed or you're working for an MSP and you feel you've been harassed by somebody else in the parliament or uh, your employer or whoever. Um, so the, the, for the person reporting it, they need to be able to clearly identify their position. Do the procedures identify, clearly state that what they are feeling uncomfortable about is actually harassment in, in terms of how it's been seen by those procedures, and therefore it's something that they feel they can report. They need to be confident that there's clarity about that and how the report will be carried out. And particularly the first step, who do I go to? needs to be abundantly clear, and that should be quite clear regardless of which of the categories we've talked about you fit into. It should be reasonably clear who you report to. Um, it might even be the case that it would be good for there to be somebody in the parliament who's independent of the various different organisations working in the parliament building who could be seen as an advisor, um, who somebody could go to and say, I've got a concern and I'm thinking of reporting it and be able to discuss it with them in the first instance somebody who's not aligned to any particular part of the organisation um, could help to, to simplify things for people. So having, if they make the decision that they want to report it, they really need to uh, be confident about what's going to happen next. You're not going to enter into a system where you don't understand what the next step is going to be. Um, and like you said about um, anonymity within that, you need to know who's going to know about it how many people are going to be involved in this and who are they, so that you can be informed when you make your decision. Um, one of the things I think that needs to be clear as well in the guidance that comes out eventually would be uh, the penalties for anybody who interferes with the fact that you have reported, who's going to influence you taking that report any further. Um, you know, if there's anybody who decides that, you know, bullying the person who's made the report or explain to them in strong terms that it's going to be bad for them as well as the person who's carried out the, the activity. Um, that kind of thing has to be clearly not acceptable. Um, so I'll pass on to let somebody else carry on. Katie. Um, I, I think there's barriers before somebody even comes forward to make a report. I think there's barriers often in workplaces and different cultures as well. Um, and people will often be very concerned about speaking about something like sexual harassment. Sexual harassment can cover a whole range of behaviours from people, what, from inappropriate comments through to like sexual assault and rape. So sexual harassment is a huge term. And we know that it's really difficult for survivors of any kind of sexual violence to come forward and make that disclosure. So I think there are procedural things 
things that are, are issues, but I think there's like issues before that, barriers before that, around about creating cultures and workplaces where people feel like actual comments, sexual harassment, and inappropriate behaviour, that that would never be tolerated. So in the, in the first step is almost looking at that and creating a culture in which people feel comfortable in. And then I think that would help itself, that would lend itself to people feeling comfortable about coming forward and thinking they would be taken seriously if that kind of culture exists. So I think those barriers exist before we even get to looking at procedural things. Cheryl. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm going to quote from uh, TUC research that was done in late 2016, actually. So as we just tip into 2018, it feels really very relevant. Um, women don't report sexual harassment um, because they think it's going to neg have a negative impact on their careers and on their working relationships. Just under a third of the women who participated in the TUC's research, which resulted in the report, still just a bit of a banter, um, said that's why they didn't report it. Almost a quarter of women don't think they'll be believed. One in five said they're too embarrassed to report it, um, which I think is a really, really important point as well. It's a very embarrassing, disempowering thing for women to experience in the workplace. There's fears of around 15% of women that's going to have a negative impact on their career. 12% of women, and it touches on what uh, colleagues have said about the clarity of the procedures, said they didn't report it um, because they didn't know how to. And very worryingly, around 10% said they weren't aware they could report it at all. So the procedures are really, really important, but I think the culture is really important as well. I know that's what you're trying to get to the heart of with this um, consultation, this process you're undertaking here. I think within the Parliament itself, there's a really specific culture. Um, it's quite a unique um, working culture. There's a very, very close working between politicians, staff and MSP aides and I think that, that adds sensitivities into people being able to either report behaviour they've experienced themselves or behaviour that they witness as a bystander. Um, and concerns about your career and reputational damage I think are particularly important within the Parliament as well. And uh, the, the long hours working culture as well, which regularly involves evening and weekend working, you know, is, is also an issue. So in addition to the kind of the reasons I've outlined from the TUC research, I think there are particular reasons within the Scottish Parliament why this kind of behaviour might not be reported. And within that TUC research, was that only on women? Uh, yes. OK. And can I ask, uh, David Thompson had uh, made mention of an independent person that someone could go and report their concerns to out, out with the uh, parliamentary structure. Would you see trade unions having a role in that? I think that's crucial, actually. I think one of the incredibly depressing things um, about the research is that only 1% of women saw their trade union as a, as a place to go to. And uh, there's a whole range of reasons for that, um, in, including some of the ones that I've already mentioned, but it's just not seen as a, as, as a workplace issue, actually. Mm -hmm. I think it's seen as a more of a, an issue for a person to resolve themselves. So one of the um, key recommendations from that research that you know, the STUC strongly support as well is for unions to be seen, certainly as a, as a, as a first point, point of call, mm -hmm. um, even if that's signposting members in the right direction. So unions should be a really crucial part of addressing uh, the issue. Thank you. Um, Aileen. Thanks, convener. Um, I was wanting to explore uh, some of the key features of workplace policies and procedures that would support a positive environment and inspire confidence and maybe some of the characteristics of good reporting mechanism. But I think actually, in answer to the convener, you, you've touched, all of you have touched on a lot of that. Could I just specifically ask Cheryl, when, when the convener asked about the role of the trade unions in this, would you envisage maybe equality reps or health and safety reps taking on that role? And think, what about people that weren't in the trade union? Well, people that are in the trade union should obviously immediately <laughs> join the appropriate trade union um, and get great representation from the appropriate trade union. Actually, just to, to touch on that, I think one of the things that came out of um, the STUC's response was um, that everyone that's involved at all in the parliament should be strongly encouraged to join the appropriate trade union. I think um, that's something that's possibly missing from the guidance generally and something that could be very quickly and easily addressed. Um, I would certainly see equality reps as having a key role to play here. Clearly, anyone that's undertaking that role needs to be appropriately trained and for that training to be refreshed on a regular basis. What would really assist, though, in terms of the cultural change that's needed is for those equality reps to be given the, the time that they need to perform that role properly, and that links with the fair work agenda as well. Um, and I know that's, again, something... I'm kind of here today with two hats on, because I'm supposed to be covering the STUC response as well. But I think that... the Progressing the fair work agenda possibly a little bit more quickly in relation to equality reps than we have so far would be extremely helpful as well. Could I just ask further on that as well? Um, in your written submission, 
Uh, oh, sorry, and I should have said I'm a member of Unite, perhaps, having uh, had the answer to that question that we got. Um, you've said that um, you, the PCS hasn't dealt with a lot of sexual harassment complaints, but that that's not because necessarily it's not happening. Reporting's not commonplace. Do you think then that because it's now under so much scrutiny, do you anticipate changes in that? Um, I, I, now, that would just be speculation, of course. Um, but I, I think when you look at the research that, that you know, that, and there's, a, there's, there's other, you know, significant research around the underreporting of, of sexual harassment, um, it wouldn't be impossible for that to be the case. Um, you know, there's, as I said, there's a number of reasons why that, that, that's not reported, but um, there, was a, there was a big response to the TUC research, um, and that's why it's a very worthy you know, piece of research to look into in, in more detail. Um, and in that sense, I guess the Scottish Parliament is just like you know, any other workplace for all variety of reasons. So you had you, it would not be unreasonable to assume that there is a level of under-reporting. We took some evidence from um, the Parliament officials uh, at a previous meeting, and they're now confirming that there's one um, helpline that people can contact, and it's an external uh, helpline. Do you think that that's going to then make a difference? I'm asking the whole panel, I'm not just asking Cheryl. Will that now make a difference? And also, um, just if there's anything else that, that you didn't give in your first response to the convener about barriers that you want to talk about, which would make for good reporting mechanisms? <laughs> um, I would just say that the uh, the very existence of, of robust procedures and making that aware uh, across the whole parliament so that pe people are uh, working here under the knowledge that this won't be approved in any way, shape or fashion. Um, it's, it's easy for a group or an organisation to say we've got a zero tolerance policy and things. That's just step one. You have to demonstrate that you've got a zero tolerance policy on it. So there has to be, you know, induction training for everybody that comes into the building that they're aware that this wouldn't be accepted here. And it, you can that initiates the prevention processes that mean that your your robust procedures hopefully won't even need to be applied. Um, so that you know. It, you know, harassment comes from an abuse of power. So, if the people who have that power know that uh, everybody is encouraged that should there be an incident, you report it. That in itself starts John, to be on preventive. that point, is that okay, convener? Just to ask, um, in the induction procedures, would you then think that um, examples of sexual harassment would be something that, that could be included there? And it just is because of what. Um, Cheryl Gedling said earlier about people perhaps thinking it's a personal thing rather than a work issue. So would that be helpful in an induction procedure? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Some, for a lot of people, it's it's there's a degree of confusion as to what people mean when they use the word harassment. So yeah, training in general, training in the and what it is, training and what can be done about it, training. That, you know, Cheryl mentioned about bystanders. That they, you know, you mentioned about what can witnesses do. How do how do witnesses feel confident to come forward? Well, witnesses hopefully can feel confident to step in before it even gets to the point that somebody needs to report something because it's already been dealt with and stops it happening in the first place. So if you have a, a general atmosphere where active bystander activity steps in at an early stage, then you get to the point where you, you don't need to be applying these uh, procedures because the report doesn't need to be made. So encouraging folk in that way, I think, is, is very effective. I think a helpline is a really helpful thing. Um, so I think it's really encouraging. I think if, it, if that's linked into like other kind of processes within the parliament, that would be really helpful as well. So we've talked already about like having an independent or third party that somebody could go to. For instance, if the helpline had a connection into that as well, so that people are able to go to it, maybe in confidence, discuss, discuss their own situation. But then if they do want to take action, that there's somebody independent that can take them through that process as well with kind of clear ways of proceeding with it. I think could be good. Dependent would a trade union health and safety and equality rep be the kind of person that you would be talking about? Yeah, I think so. And with with like a lot of training around about like kind of sexual violence awareness as well, because I think it is really important that the, the correct messages and uh, are given when somebody makes a disclosure the first time, and also for people to understand that it, there, you were saying about it's often seen as being a personal thing. Well, I think that one of the difficulties is with uh, with an experience of sexual harassment or any kind of sexual violence is really difficult if you're in a situation which is undermining or traumatising you to then make clear decisions or do it within a tight time frame. So I think having a bit of flexibility is really important. 
Emma. I just wanted to come in on um, the point about induction and learning and that it isn't just about a one-time um, sexual harassment training course that you've done that you can just check the box and say, okay, I've done this, it's, it's all settled, I'm good to go now. It's really about continual learning um, for any employee in the Scottish Parliament. Um, and part of what will fall into that is being able to collect and share data um, on reporting uh, investigations and then sanctions for that kind of behavior so that it's it's a continual awareness, it's not a one-off, um, and it's not just a checkbox that people can say, okay, we've done this now, we're, we're set. Thanks, thanks, Convention. Jamie. Yeah, can I, just before I ask questions, I wanted to ask, I just wanted a, a couple of things. The term that we use, and it p picks up really uh, um, on what's been discussed, the term harassment, in some way that suggests it's repeated but of course it, it isn't, it can be a one-off incident. Do you think actually the terminology we use, we have to look at that so that people could be better, under, better understanding what they should be reporting and how they're reporting? Do you think that term harassment could even put people off because they think, well, it was just a one-off incident, I don't have to report it, particularly if it's what might be described as low, low level. So that terminology, should we, should we be looking at that, do you think? I think, I think potentially that, that could be an issue. One of the, in my submission, I um, gave you some feedback about where, where there was lack of protection for women that had been in contact with the Scottish Women's Rights Centre. And one of the survivors that I spoke to, it was a very serious assault that happened to her, but there had been years of sexual harassment. Mm. But because she worked in a male-dominated environment where that was almost seen as being banter or daily, daily, like daily exchanges, mm. she f she didn't realise the risk that that, that that posed because the culture was so, it was so common within that culture so it was really hard for her to then identify what was escalating and I, I think she could never have known what was going to happen um, but the culture and the terminology mm. probably played into that. Okay. I think in general it's just it's good for people to have a better understanding of what is actually being referred to and mm. um, it doesn't really matter what the title of it is it's an understanding of the behaviour and more importantly people understanding what behaviours that are unacceptable for them to use and, and acknowledge the fact and look in, inwardly a wee bit to acknowledge the fact that perhaps some of these uh, behaviours are things that they have touched on in the past and are no longer acceptable. Yes, sure. I, I, mean, I, I think that's a really important point, actually, and we've seen some of the really actually vile reporting in a lot of the press and media, haven't we, about, goodness me, you can't pay anyone a compliment anymore. It's political correctness gone mad. And, all of these appalling people that crawl out from under stones when things like this um, are exposed. I mean, a great starting point is the Equality Act definition, which I think makes it really clear um, what sexual harassment is actually in a in a kind of brief and really um, way that's easily easy to comprehend. Um, to come back to the point um, that Elaine Smith made about using examples, I think that's invaluable, actually. It's really important to do that so that people are very clear about the kind of behaviour that's not acceptable. Um, you know, and, and these range, of the, I mean, there's a spectrum, isn't there, of behaviour, of course, but, but all of it <laughs> is unwanted behaviour. And actually, even to use the term low level is quite interesting that you use that term, actually, because that's usually part of a pattern of behaviour um, that, that goes on for some considerable time, but is a huge, huge issue because it's unwelcome to the individual concerned. I think um, it's important to remember as well, and again, it's particularly in the context of the Parliament, that this, this doesn't just happen within work to be work-related. It takes place on social media as well, which is a huge, huge part of... Of working life these days it takes place at social events um, and it takes place at um, official events uh, with the workplace too so anything you're doing in connection with work is work so it, it isn't okay <laughs> to indulge in that kind of behavior at, at an event in the evening or the weekend either um, okay uh, um, just kind of in, a, in some ways kind of similar to that um, in the in gender submission um, it says Scottish Parliament has never tolerate or ignore sexual harassment or inappropriate conduct of any of any kind or in any form which I think imagine uh, all organizations would would support that so it, um, you know I think within the Parliament I think within the MSP code of conduct there is this presumption for um, uh, informal resolution so you know, I suppose what are the positive and negatives of informal re resolutions? Um, uh, you know, before cl complaints go to a formal, for more formal process, do you think there is a place for those, or would you suggest that it should immediately go to a to be reported and go through the procedures, formal procedures? I think it depends so, on the oh, nature. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it just depends on the nature of what's getting reported, whether it feels. It, whether, it, you know, if somebody independent is going to be involved, whether they are of the opinion with their training that it's something that could be resolved 
in a in relatively low level way. Uh, and low level, I mean, I'm talking about the resolution process rather than the, the activity. I think for myself, do you want to jump in? No. Um, when I was writing that, what I was thinking is that it really should be up to, um, when we discuss informal and formal, that that should be really up to the person uh, to decide and that they should have all the available information on what an informal complaint versus a formal complaint entails so that when they make that decision, it's an informed one. And as of right now, as the policy stands, I'm really not sure what either entails um, for people who experience sexual harassment in the Scottish Parliament. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. It really needs to be for the individual to decide from themselves what's most appropriate for them. Having said that, one of the benefits of informal resolution is often it could be done really, really quickly. Unfortunately, formal processes, with well, the best <coughs> will in the world, sometimes take longer. So there's, it's really crucial that both of those avenues of resolution are, av are available, but um, it is only ever for the individual to decide with all of the information available about what each option means for them, what the potential outcome is. As long as there's clarity around that, then the individual must be able to decide for themselves. Can I just have one very quick, actually it's slightly unrelated, but it was a point, um, Cheryl, you, you made earlier uh, about the, the embarrassment um, that people face and that's why they Do you think it's important in that reporting process and perhaps once the initial complaint has, has gone in, um, perhaps the follow-up evidence taking, etc., that um, people are able to access a, a person of the same sex or uh, to actually do that reporting? And is that happening at the moment in enough cases? Well, in answer to that, Probably not, for a variety of reasons. Um, but is that important? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, well, I, just like everything else, it comes down to making sure that um, time and money is available actually to resource this properly. But the benefits of doing that, so the individuals choose how best this should be taken forward for themselves, are really significant, actually, because, again, that's another barrier to reporting. Um, you know, I, w I would go to... That 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 uh, I would go to that. Well, gosh, let's criticise ourselves. I would go to that union rep, but um, that's a sixty-year-old man, and I'm not going to share that experience with him as a twenty-four-year-old woman. So uh, <laughs> I, th I think I think that is a really important point, and that 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 option should be available. I, I would very much agree with that. I think when we think about um, survivors reporting sexual crimes to the police, like women and, or, and male survivors as well are given the option of whether they want to speak to a female or a male officer. So I think it's really important. Most people prefer to speak with a female um, in, th in that situation where they're making a disclosure. I think it is really important um, that, that, that you have that opportunity as well. Great. Um, thank you very much and good morning. Going back to the point that was made, which I think is perhaps one of the most important points in all of this, and that is um, that most people would probably agree in principle that there should be zero tolerance of harassment, but then when it comes to the point of having the confidence, it's so often justified that this, oh, it's not really harassment, I, I don't have a right to report it, no one will take me seriously, etc. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, justifications of harassment on the basis of some other reason. Now you mentioned the Parliament particularly, which has a unique sort of um, power balance and a unique way of working. How do you clarify in people's minds what is wrong, um, particularly in, tho in those that want to report it, that they are perfectly, um, they have the right and the liberty to report something? when they're justifying on the basis of it's a unique set of circumstances in terms of power balance, or they work in a particular environment which is very male dominated and that just is part of the culture. And that's bigger than just questions around the parliament. Does that make sense? I guess I'm wondering, is your question, how do we encourage people to report? Um, basically my question is, how do you ensure that people understand what the definition is of harassment and that they know that they therefore are perfectly it, it's within their right to report it mm -hmm. i think it's the culture i think it's a case of through training people and through encouraging discussion about it and making it a very open subject matter people get to know because they get to understand what other people think and what everybody agrees is acceptable and isn't acceptable and on the whole, people know. I mean, if it's one of those situations where if it's concerning you that it's happening to you, it's probably not acceptable. 
but that doesn't mean you'll convince yourself that it's not acceptable. So if the general atmosphere is such that this, this just doesn't happen here because we just do not put up with it, mm. uh, and if it's seen happening, somebody's going to comment. We're not going to wait till you report it. Somebody's going to make a comment. In practical terms, how do you get the message out there? In really practical, you know, we've got posters, we've got um, emails around the helpline. In practical ways, how do you do that? I wonder if there's like awareness campaigns. I know that the Equally Safe Scottish Government have recently um, looked at funding an awareness campaign. I think that would be really helpful and to focus on like what is what is sexual harassment, like perpetrators' behaviour, rather than fo focusing on sort of victim survivors. You know, so that the messages that are going out are really kind of about this is not appropriate behaviour. It's not acceptable. So that people when they're are experiencing that or seeing that and saying, well, that, that is what's happened to me and that's not acceptable. And there's also a really clear message going out to people that are perpetrating that behaviour as well. So I think like having awareness campaigns is a really important thing. And I think some of the things we've touched on already about kind of culture within uh, workplaces, but also about like embedding within, like from the induction period all the way through, that that's, it's something that's a kind of constant conversation like if you think culturally in our society there's so many mixed messages we give out about gender-based violence anyway um, that it's not surprising they're all within the workplace as well so I, th I think it is about trying to unpick some of the messages and, and then and then reframe them just to <coughs> come in on the, on the on the back of that to you know to agree with everything that's been said I, I it's that I mean, it's a really difficult question, isn't it? To how do you give people the confidence to to come forward? Uh, there is something around the process being very clear, I think, and that, so that's not off-putting. Um, being clear, there's a there's a leadership role, I think, for every organisation as well that employs a staff of any kind to make it clear that this is not acceptable behaviour. One thing that is obviously really difficult because of the nature of sexual harassment is to get robust kind of data and monitoring. For instance, there's a, a, I appreciate Parliament staff aren't civil servants, but I think it's useful to touch on the um, civil service employee survey, which is done every year. Uh, it, it does look into harassment. Um, it does look into the willingness of staff to call out unacceptable behaviour. And I think being able to kind of monitor broadly um, the, how people feel able to do that, and unfortunately the statistics on that show that they don't feel any more able to do that than they used to 10 years ago, which is uh, a bit perhaps a failure of the policies and procedures. I think um, confidentiality is a crucial point as well. People need to know they can come forward and describe their um, experiences, that they will be believed and that no step will be taken in the process without them agreeing to that step mm. as well. So some of this process, some of this is cultural, but I think training, I know there are issues around mandatory training, but I think training should be mandatory on this um, for every member of staff every politician um, without fear or favour. So it's quite clear that everyone is held to the same standard. Mm. Sorry, just <laughs> I should have mentioned earlier, um, when, when I was putting together the written submission, I had contact from somebody <coughs> who had actually I'd put a quote in, in the paper and it actually related specifically to the parliament, her experience. And um, I think the thing that she really wanted me to convey was that something had happened which she considered to be less serious, which she did try to report through a number of different avenues and she still not received any kind of feedback from that. And when she then experienced sexual harassment, within the parliament, she didn't feel that like she could come forward and report that at all. So I think it was a really important kind of comment in there about not waiting for things to escalate, not not thinking that it's only the kind of high end of, um, you know, sexual assaults and, and sexual harassment, but to be thinking about that actually this is like a continuum yeah. of violence that women are experiencing and, and, the, and the things that people might consider to be less serious actually really affect how we see the more serious things and also whether or not we feel confident about coming forward. And I, th I thought it was really interesting that she made that point. I wondered about sorry. No, sorry. No. The other thing I wondered about was just about like having having champions within the parliament. You know, people that are really skilled up in working. I mean, we talked about union reps earlier, but sort of champions in, in the way that I think one of the suggestions that we made in our paper was you know you have LGBTI champions in other workplaces and maybe about having a similar sort of approach or adapting that kind of approach and looking at that in terms of sexual harassment. Great. Just a, a follow up. Um, in terms of duty of care to both those that have reported and the perpetrator throughout the investigation and sanctioning process, what are your views on how to ensure that there is support available to both sides? 
think it's a difficult thing, isn't it? Um, to, to, I think there is a duty of care, um, and I think that within a, a work setting, often employers, when, when there's situations with sexual harassment, they feel that um, they have to support the survivor, quite rightly, but then also they have a responsibility as an employer to, to the person who's been accused. And it, it can often depend on the size of a workforce, whether or not it's possible to sort of separate those people and create kind of safe spaces and make sure that the interactions are, are much more managed or that they, they don't have contact with each other. And I, I think the point that Cheryl made previously as well about workplace is one thing but there's all sorts of things associated with your work at evenings and weekends and whatever as well and there's also third parties that can come into those situations so I think you have got a duty of care and I think it's so individual as well I think it's about working with an individual survivor around about what what has happened how do they see it what do they feel would be something that they that they feel would be beneficial to them and then seeing you know if you can find a way forward around about that Unsurprisingly, um, I think that would be a, a, a role for a, a trade union rep. I mean, we routinely represent members who have, who are perpetrators and who have suffered unacceptable behaviour. So, I, th I think uh, extending uh, the role of the union rep to do that um, gives it that kind of independence as well, um, because it, it, it is challenging to, to respond to that. You know, if, if you approach HR or personnel, you know they they are seen <laughs> as the kind of organisational response and. Rightly or wrongly, there's a sense there that um, the person of a higher grade um, is the person that's most likely to be supported. So, uh, you know, hope that doesn't sound too controversial, but unfortunately, that is a lot of people's experience. So, I mean, I, you know, certainly from a trade union perspective, I would expect trade unions to be playing a key role in this, I think a very significant role in terms of independence. So we've got a huge wealth of experience um, in, in front of the committee today. Do you have a organisations that you've worked with who you see have best practice in this area in terms of culture, in terms of supporting people come forward that you can share with the committee or policies that you've seen developed in other areas that you would think would be um, transferable to the Scottish Parliament or, or, or areas that we could look at? In, in, in my submission, I, I, I given uh, just a few kind of campaigns that I thought might be of interest. Um, in, in, you know, in terms of thinking about the culture on the messages. So um, there's a lot of work happening in, in schools and universities and colleges just now, looking at addressing sexual harassment. Um, and I think there's probably things that can be learned from them in terms of thinking about um, like kind of awareness about like working with men about being positive actions of ch uh, for change, about advocacy and policy and stuff like that. So I think there's examples out there in terms of universities. Um, and I know that recently um, Close the Gap have also um, been funded to look at accreditation for employers. I think that's quite an interesting approach as well um, that could be worth considering. Anyone else? Uh, I'd just say that our organisation, White Ribbon Scotland, is about educating men about these issues and getting men to realise that there's a benefit to everybody for these situations to change. Um, and, you know, there's room, I think, for that type of training to come into the, the general training that might take place within the Parliament building. Um, just to touch as well on the, the kind of duty of care side and, and the balance of it, I think what's important on both sides is that there's time scales within the procedures that people know how long this is going to take and then also that there's clear guidance on what should happen in terms of the, the effect it's going to have on both parties' working environment. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, again, I agree with that. Um, I think um, there's something around the uh, kind of clarification of policies. I mean, obviously, as you said, you, there's a wide range of experience here, and you'd, you'd be drawing on the experience of, of the people sitting around this table as well. Rape crisis in Glasgow and it is, ref is referenced in the STUC submission, where some good work's been done. I was at the um, Scottish Women's Commission um, event a week and a half ago, which was about sexual harassment, and there was somebody from the National Union of Students who was talking about work that was being done in Dundee. Um, this was around what is acceptable and unacceptable behaviour. And it was, it was it was called "Is this okay?" And it was just the kind of simplicity of that was really appealing. Actually, just that sense of "Is what I'm doing okay?" It seemed to be a really kind of useful way of making people reflect on their behaviour. Um, one thing I would say is, even if you have the best policy in the world, um, if it's not implemented, then there's no it has no credibility. So policies are, are fantastic, but they need to be followed and, and adhered to. Otherwise, people will still not come forward and report. And I think that touches on the example that um, my, you know, my colleague gave here about why somebody wouldn't come forward and, and report that. 
to be fair, I, I don't think there are easy answers to this, which is why this is still significantly underreported, why it continues to be a huge issue. But I think working with the kind of the, the groups that are here today, giving evidence, working with the STUC and the trade unions, is a really kind of positive way of taking this forward and giving people confidence in the process. It's quite general in these types of procedures that the focus is all on when do you report, who should report, how do they report, what's going to happen when they report, and there should be a lot of onus in the, the procedures on the perpetrator in terms of what's, what it means if you perpetrate these activities, how it's going to affect your work, how it's going to affect your position here. You know, because if, it, you know, if we're talking about abuse of power, people need to realise that that power will not protect them. It might give them the, the feeling that they have the right to do it and give them in that kind of entitlement in their head, but it doesn't give them the power to be protected. And that needs to be clear as a result of how these procedures are written and how they, they get made available and easy to use. Thank you. Alexander. The, the STUC talk about that over 50% of women are likely to be harassed during their work lifespan. Now, that's a staggering statistic uh, that we have to acknowledge. So prevention, and you've touched on prevention today, uh, about the key... Uh, to, to monitoring, to coaching, to supporting, uh, but the employer has a has an, an you know a role within that uh, to ensure that they monitor what's going on, and if there's a trigger that happens uh, within the environment of the workplace, how that is managed. So it would be good to hear your views on what you believe that trigger should be, and how people would feel appropriate. Uh, to ensure that their employer uh, was on their side. Because as we've touched on today, there's a, that faith or that relationship between the individual and the employer still has some distance to go to believe uh, that they're going to be actually taken for real and taken on board. So I'd like to expand on that if you can. Well, can I just pick up sure. on that figure then? It, it's, it's, it's higher than that. Four-fifths of women report uh, sexual harassment, unfortunately. So it's even more, a stag more of a staggering Thank figure you know. than, than uh, you had originally thought. Um, uh, I mean, one, one of the suggestions in the STUC submission I think is interesting is rather than wrapping sexual harassment up with discrimination and bullying generally, for instance, dignity at work type policies that we've seen coming through workplaces in recent years, actually having a specific policy around sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's certainly something that's that's worth exploring. Um, and, and, and that means we can get disaggregated data. I touched on the civil service employee survey. And although it reports on bullying and harassment in the workplace, there's no disaggregation there to dig down into whether or not that there's a sexual harassment element of that. There will be, but of course it's impossible to tell. So I, th I think the other th difficulty is around how you monitor. I mean, you, obviously, yeah, I know the uh, Parliament's undertaken a survey, and I think it's really, really significant that was done, and I'm going to be very interested in seeing the results uh, from that. But it's difficult to monitor these because they're shrouded in secrecy. For instance, often, particularly with more serious cases, for want of a better phrase, um, there's a on a gagging agreement, you know, a resolution is reached, but people um, involved in this are not allowed to talk about it, including the person who's the victim of unacceptable behaviour. And I think this is something we're going to need to look at because while it's shrouded in secrecy, we're not going to be able to, to change the culture. We're not going to be able to resolve it. So I don't have any easy answers to that, but it's something that needs to be looked at. Very much agree in terms of like the kind of confidentiality and the gagging clauses. Like the women that I spoke with, um, that was something that was quite relevant for them. One woman, uh, it was impossible for her to talk about what was happening while there was a, it was going to tribunal and there was investigations that were working, all those kind of things. And rumours started going about within her workplace about her conduct, about whether or not she had done something wrong, whether or not she was being disciplined. Um, and that was obviously really difficult and it played into all the kind of power and control issues that we've talked about in terms of sexual harassment. Um, and for the other women that I spoke with, um, it went, she had, um, I think it was six meetings in 12 months. I mean, it was a really onerous process for her. Um, and there, it looks like there will be a kind of gag in order, you know, when it, when it comes to conclusion. And again, that's really dreadful because what has happened is that uh, both of those women are no longer in, in their 
place of employment. Both the perpetrators are still in their place of employment. Neither of the women are able to talk about what happened or, or the process where it went to tribunal and what the issues were with that. And the perpetrators are continuing to be, if you like, unaffected by that without the impact on their career or their financial sort of a, you know, safety or security. And I think it's just it's so unequal and it plays into like inequality of women in the workplace where we think about women are often more likely to be in part time or less secure employment. And so I think it is it's like it is a really big picture, you know, when you look at it. I mean, you know, you know the, these gagging orders or the, the cover up that people believe takes place, or even if there is an inquiry or an investigation, it's a whitewash to some people. Uh, and, and you've identified individuals who have gone through that trauma uh, and have not got the right resolution at the end of the day. Uh, and, and we need to ensure that we get that message across that, that it has to be looked at in the round and we have to have confidence in the system or once again it's not going to benefit the individuals who feel because then the reporting won't continue to happen. It will be underreported again. I, th I think you're right. I think it is about confidence. Like, um, bo both those women, they, they weren't employed in the Parliament, but both those women's experience, what they both said to me was that they felt the whole process was about protecting mm -hmm. the, the organisation or service that they worked for and its reputation rather than about what had happened to them. And there were really serious attacks and have, have had really long-term effects on those women. Both of them are not in employment anymore. It's, it's, it's been a really difficult thing you know, for them and has a, a huge impact. I think to some degree, there's a, a, when any organisation is trying to make their procedures more robust on this, they have to go through an element of um, a, a kind of pain period, if you like, where they suddenly are applying it a lot more frequently, but in doing so, get the message across that this is just genuine zero tolerance and genuinely unacceptable, and we will take part in doing something about it. And then you get back to the other side where that message and that culture just becomes pervasive around the, the organisation uh, and starts to you know, uh, reduce the number of instances and therefore the, the need for it to be reported. Because the, the sanction, is the, at the end of the day, is, is what the individuals want to see. They want to believe that they've been dealt with and they want to see something happen. And if that doesn't happen, then there's, there's little point in yeah, the process. Yeah, but a lot of that comes from... Knowing that you've been believed, yep. knowing that you've been respected, that you've been dealt with professionally, that you were put first rather than, than the organisation was put first. And knowing yep. that there is going to be a sanction for that kind of behaviour, yep. because at the moment it's not clear that, that there will be, hmm. and how that sanction is going to be decided, by who, under what criteria, yep. um, and all of that is absent information at the moment, which I think is a, a massive barrier. Mm -hmm. And all those things have a preventive effect as well. Because yeah. the potential perpetrators are aware of all those things taking place. So it works from both sides. Thank you, Convener. Patrick. Thank you. Good morning. And can I draw members' attention to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests? And also, just because we've been discussing the STUC submission, uh, just put on the record that the STUC is my party's landlord. Um, very fair and excellent landlord, but there it is. Um, I wanted to ask some questions about sanctions. Um, and in particular, one of the things that uh, Cheryl Gedling mentioned uh, early on is that this, uh, the Scottish Parliament, is an unusual workplace. One of the things that's unusual about it is that there's a group of people working here who cannot, under any circumstances, be dismissed uh, for something equivalent to gross misconduct or, or what have you. Um, I think there's a great deal that we can do and that the Parliament is doing to address uh, making it easier to challenge inappropriate behaviour, helping somebody to understand why their behaviour is inappropriate. At the other extreme, uh, we can obviously be more robust at making sure that behaviour that meets a, a criminal standard is dealt with uh, as robustly as it needs to be. Is there a gap in the middle? Uh, there's obviously a democratic argument as to why MSPs can't be dismissed uh, from their seats, but is there a a counter case that that protection should be removed, uh, and if so, uh, how should that be done, and, and what kind of behaviours might fall into that that area uh, where we might have have difficulty in the future? <laughs> are, well, are you weighing the duty of care with the sanctions that can be imposed on? Well, there is a there is a range of sanctions that would be available. Uh, if an MSP had been found to uh, have, have mm -hmm. 
uh, carried out serious behaviour, uh, and that that range of sanctions does not include removing mm -hmm. them from office. Uh, and so, I suppose my question is: is there a is there a gap in comparison with other workplaces where a person ultimately, if the behaviour was serious or persistent or uh, could not be successfully challenged in other ways, a person might be dismissed from their post. Is that something that we should look at? Uh, and if so, what is the range of circumstances that might not be amenable to the sanctions that we currently have available to us? Can I leave yeah. on that? I, is there a, yes, there is a gap, actually, um, undoubtedly. Um, uh, so it could be regarded as in those individuals, you know, the MSPs that you talked about, I guess being being held to a different standard. Um, I'm six minutes, or oh, sorry, five minutes left of this session. Um, I'm sure we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but I mean, uh, to, to to confirm that the Parliament's serious about about looking at this and addressing it, then I certainly think it should be considered. And perhaps a useful starting point would be you used to term yourself gross misconduct. So what other workers would be dismissed for mm -hmm. doing? I think would be certainly a that type of behaviour, which is there's a whole range of things covered by that, including uh, sexual harassment, that would certainly be a good starting point, I think, to look at the types of behaviour where you would actually consider whether or not someone should be allowed to continue serving as an MSP. I'm guessing that there's like a code of conduct for MSPs as well, and I wonder if that's something that has been looked at in terms of thinking about the, the different kind of behaviours that we've, we've talked about in terms of sexual harassment. And I would agree with Cheryl that I think it, it does fall short. There is something missing in there, but I would also just put a caution in there about like whether it meets a criminal standard. I think like often people don't go forward and formally report to the police mm -hmm. for a whole number of complex reasons. Um, so that that wouldn't necessarily be like you know where I would think the 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 gap always exists because I, I, I okay. think often that when people do report as well because particularly with sexual t uh, crimes there's often not other witnesses so often there's issues about whether or not a case could proceed anyway so mm -hmm. I think that that in itself there's there's questions about how effective that would be as being your kind of further extreme I think it, it's possibly the ultimate example within the, the parliament situation where um, the power that's been given to somebody by virtue of the fact that they can't be removed opens up that idea that it's uh, you've got such a strong power there that could be abused and result in harassment um, and if there's no sanction that can take that power away then there's no sanction to be concerned about uh, I don't know enough about parliamentary procedures to suggest how you go about changing it so that MSPs can be removed when they've been democratically elected um, so, um, yeah, it's kind of over to you guys on that one. <laughs> and I think, yes, there's a massive gap there. If we're talking about gross misconduct, I think it fosters the very culture that we're discussing today that we have shared all of our concerns about. I think it's a failure to your responsibilities to your citizens. Um, they want to be represented by someone who has um, been, I don't know what the word was, found, convicted of a gross misconduct. Um, and I think it's yet another barrier to women coming forward that there is no punishment for that kind of behavior. So what's the incentive of reporting if at the end of the day you're still sitting in a room with the person who sexually harassed you, or worse? Thank you. Just, just finally on this, um, is there also anything that any of you would like to suggest by way of uh, other sanctions short of a final step uh, that might be uh, might have been used successfully in other workplaces that we should be aware of, uh, but which uh, haven't been considered as part of the, the code of conduct. Are there any other steps uh, by way of sanctions that, uh, that might be worth incorporating into our code of conduct, short of that absolutely last resort? Can I ask, would it be possible for us to write to you about that? Um, that really helpful. Yeah, just to, to, to give that some thought. And I have people I need to consult as well, obviously. I'm not speaking just on behalf of PCS today. No, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. OK, Eileen. Thanks very much, convener. I wonder, it was just to explore a bit further the MSP issue that uh, my colleague Patrick Harvey raised there. And from two different angles, I suppose. I mean, in the end, with the MSP issue, um, we talked about gagging orders, and perhaps some women MSPs might be a bit reticent about coming forward for a couple of reasons. One is the publicity surrounding this. Um, you know, it would be played out in the press if it were to to be made public, and that's maybe something that, that 
women MSPs, or any MSPs actually, depending on the nature of the, the sexual harassment, um, I just use the term women because that's the, the majority, but they might not they might not want that, so that's one point. Um, the second point would be, in the end, I suppose an MSP would lose their job because it would be, and, and if it was, because that would be up to the parties and the whips, and so if they were removed from their party list, for instance, they couldn't stand to gain if they were um, suspended or expelled from their party, then they might be able, if they were constituency members or list members, they could sit to the end of the session, but in the end, they would lose their jobs. However, it takes me back then to the point that I did want to talk about, which is the role of party whips. And it might be easier for women, for members to complain about someone in another party if you're just looking at the political perspective, but it might be far more difficult to complain about someone in your own party when you, you consider the politics of it as well and what you know what damage it might do to your party. So this is a whole other um, issue around MSPs. And um, so I think the whips are very, very important. And therefore, I would ask, I think it was Katie mentioned earlier, it's important to be able to talk to these talk about these things to another woman, if it's a, a woman. It's, um, so I make that point just simply because as well in my party, up until um, actually change of leadership, the whips were all men. And I think that is a barrier to women being able to, to discuss this sort of thing. So I don't know if you have any opinions on that. I did want to ask one further question. It was just um, perhaps, Katie, you could comment on that because you did mention that earlier. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Like you, you, you need to have like women that, that that people can go to to discuss it with. It might be that they, you know, there's a whole range of options around about what's happened for a particular set of circumstances. But I think that if 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 it's all male whips, then it's going to be really unlikely that somebody's going to feel that that it's it's an open avenue for them. Um, it's interesting you managed about you managed you mentioned about damage to the party because I think that's what. Um, people fear about like damage to the like, reputation of a service or whatever mm. as well or an employer so that that's always there and um, one thing I would say is I think that first response that somebody gets um, is really important the the people that I've spoken to um, they, they talked about how their managers like the people who should have made the initial response and managed that process weren't equipped to do it and they had poor responses and and that really undermined the their their sense of kind of power or control in that situation and played into all other things that gone on so I think it's really important that there, there are women that, that people can disclose to and that they're properly trained and able to take forward that function as well. And if I may, I would say to your comment that it goes back to the massive power imbalance and 65% of MSPs are men and it this being a bigger issue about um, women's representation in political and public life. Could I ask a, a, another question about some slightly different convener? Um, it was actually around the Equality Act. I'm trying to see where, where I read it. I think it was the STUC said that in 2013, the third party harassment provisions were repealed. Um, and that then led me to wonder, and it was something that <coughs> was mentioned earlier, about uh, third parties coming into the parliament. Because there are obviously a lot of events, there are um, lobbying goes on, there are all sorts of third parties, and there are all sorts of employees and MSPs in the, in the Parliament who could be affected by that. So if staff or MSP staff or MSPs themselves were subject to sexual harassment at these events, then the, it, under this repeal, does that mean that there's no, that there's no recourse? <laughs> The, the, well, there's no legal recourse. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons the TUC and the SGC are calling for that to be reinstated, okay. which is why getting the policy right. So giving people, you know, the, um, the, the the sense that it will still be addressed. I mean, to be fair, you want most workplace issues to be addressed and dealt with well before you go anywhere near, you know, yeah. a, a tribunal or a legal case. So that is very significant and is part of the power imbalance as well and has made the situation worse. There's no doubt about that. But... Um, that doesn't mean it can't be addressed. It doesn't mean people don't have, um, you know, the option of, of taking an issue forward. But it's, you know, to make a point that's been said, made several times during this session, it's absolutely crucial that the policy nails that as well and, and covers specifically the third party issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I've been struck particularly by something that David Thompson said, which was preventing potential 
perpetrators. And it suggests that much of what we've spoken about today in terms of process is about deterrence um, and accepting that perhaps that is the only option. I wonder if the panel would like to speak about how we more fundamentally change the, uh, the culture, and Emma Trotter touched on this with the, the issue of the overall power imbalance, but I'm keen to sort of can explore some of the reasons of why men, and it is predominantly men, would, would commit these acts in the first place, and how we, more broadly as a society, but specifically within Parliament, change that culture so that maybe in an ideal scenario we don't actually have to think about deterrence because the acts would not be... Um, people would not be thinking about committing such acts in the first place. Yeah, that's uh, the, the kind of whole being for us is uh, existing this White Ribbon Scotland is about educating men uh, and educating them about how we can change the attitudes of men as they're growing up from being young boys. So uh, we're really talking about cultural change across the whole country rather mm -hmm. than just within a parliament building. Um And yeah, if that's successful, then... Uh, you would have less of a problem to consider. Um, but certainly once you get to, to the stage of people coming into the building, then you need to address it within these walls. Um, the, it's a long-term project to create prevention by changing attitudes, but it can be done. It's been done in a number of different campaigns to do with seatbelt wearing, drink driving, all sorts of different campaigns you could think of. Um, so, yeah, it's about... Um, ensuring that prevention is properly funded, properly getting uh, spread across the country and, and having a wide enough effect. Um, and you're talking about a generational change. So it's also about waiting to see the results of that. One of the hardest things for us in other prevention campaigns is proving you've been successful because we're talking decades down the line when you have full success. And even in terms of influence, it's, you're not there on the day somebody doesn't do something because of something you said in a training session. Um, these are the always difficult things for prevention campaigns. Um, but, yeah, that's, what, that's essentially what you're getting to, the idea of let's have cultural change across the country. And largely what we've been talking about is of the things that could happen within the Parliament building or what can happen with every organisation across the country. I think just building on what has already been said that yeah you're looking at a generational change so going into you know going all the way back to looking at young girls and boys and the social norms um, that force girls and boys to take on certain roles um, when they're in school so um, girls you know to be more caring and passive and boys to be strong and tough and you know that's where we're going that's kind of where we need to start this conversation if we want to talk about changing culture in Scotland um, pushing for women's equality. I think, though, that what I wouldn't want to lose sight of right now in the landscape is that there is a power differential um, that has to be taken into account in the Scottish Parliament and that that power imbalance does cause, create um, an environment that fosters um, coercion and exploitation. And that's um, not something we can lose sight of, but that... Um, you know, th these conversations that we're having today about sexual harassment policy mm -hmm. and practice can have an impact. Yes, sorry. I would, I would just say in terms of prevention that I agree it's really important to, to go right back. Great Place in Scotland have been going into schools and recently expanding its prevention programme and I think going in and talking about attitudes um, and relationships and equality and consent and all those things from an early age is really important in terms of shaping people's understanding of relationships um, and, and of how they relate to other people. So I think that's really important. But you mentioned deterrence and I think that the deterrence aspect mm -hmm. has to come with consequences and, and that's what in a way I think maybe you've been trying to get to earlier on is like what is the consequence of this behaviour and things like gagging orders play into, play into a situation where we, we can't talk about what the consequences are because we're, you know you wouldn't, you wouldn't be allowed to do so legally and I, and I think that's one of the things like there has to be clear consequences for having perpetrated those kind of acts but until we can start seeing what they are um, I think that that's it's hard to deter it and, and I wonder if, if we're talking about awareness raising campaigns like we talked about earlier there's stuff about attitudes but could there be stuff about consequence as well? Well, you, you ask why men do it. Well, they, they do it because they can, you know. Um, and unfortunately, as we've seen recently, they, they're, they're doing it, unfortunately, in possibly bigger numbers than they have been in the past. The, uh, some of the campaigns that have been run, I think is there, is there a, there's a, a budget, I think, for kind of social... Um, 
changes like I think about things like see me and zero tolerance so I'm not sure if that's something that the parliament can fund but I think that that's quite useful in you know awareness raising around uh, domestic violence around mental health um I think there's a real role for the parliament in leading the way on this and one way of doing this is is, is looking at your internal procedures but it's about what you say um to to, to the people of Scotland as well um I think what peer what your peers do is really important um again this came up at the Scottish Women's Convention session um, that took place recently around, you, you know, if you like, a group of men sitting having a bit of banter in the pub, for instance. Uh, you know, it can be really, really challenging if something that you personally find unacceptable has been said to actually call that behaviour out and challenge it. So some of the uh, achieving societal change is, is massive. Um, clearly, we're not going to resolve that around the table today, but it, 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 it's, it's changing that kind of behaviour and giving people the confidence to call out you know, their own peer group, their friends and family when something unacceptable is said and done. And the role of the bystander in this, I think, is is really important to look at as well and something that needs to be developed. I'd be keen as well just to um, hear the panel's observations on political culture. Just to give a very simple example, this committee has worked in a very consensual and constructive way to explore a serious issue. Now, later on, the footage of this will be uploaded onto the Parliament's YouTube channel. And I can guarantee that if you go and look at how many views it gets, it will be dwarfed in comparison to in an hour and a half or so when First Minister's Questions begins, which is adversarial, combative, and is reported on by a press gallery dominated by male political journalists. So I would just be keen to hear what your observations are, particularly about political culture and the masculine, testosterone fueled adversarial, combative nature of it, and what role that plays. In politics in just about all aspects of society because it's how we bring young boys up to think they have to behave to prove themselves better than another um, rather than working with peers be combative against them um, it's it's what we teach it's about you know you've got to be good at sports you've got to be stronger you've got to be bigger and better um, if you're going to be recognized as a real man they need to change that we need to, we need to change the way we bring up children and, and how we stereotype them and then that feeds into how the political culture and the journalistic culture starts to affect things uh, once you have people growing up into that that have a different ideal in the first place. I, I think like whether uh, you know there's been so many things in, in the press recently um, like about Westminster and in Holyrood and, and people that have made had appointments to different roles where they've made really horrendously misogynistic comments in, in the past and stuff and what, what I find really amazing about that is that there seems to be a debate for a period of time about is that enough for that person to be seen as not suitable for this role and you're like where's the debate in that you know like surely if somebody's making like really really inappropriate comments or threats online or have said things that are just completely out there um, whether it was two years in the past or ten years in the past it, it does you know show an attitude and, and, and I think sometimes I find it surprising that it's not taken more more seriously immediately one of the things as well is that you've got to engender an atmosphere where people challenge that type of thing um, and I, I mean that in, in all levels not just at political level but clearly it's good if leaders are uh, are commenting on it and, and being more appropriate in their word, choice of words and, and how they put down misogynistic comments that are getting made. Um, but it matters as well within a family situation. There's a lot of work, as, as Katie mentioned, getting done by rape crisis, going into schools and, and working with children. Um, and we've done some work in the past in schools as well. Uh, and children get on board quite quickly with this. They don't naturally want to be abusive. Um, and they, they get the programme and the idea of how you can be better in your behaviour with other people. But if they go home and they don't see any evidence that supports that, you quickly lose that support that they've given on the day. So if they go home and they say, this is what I was doing at school today, and the reaction they get from parents or somebody else in, in, the, in the house is, well, that's a lot of rubbish, you know, you bother about that. Or there's a comment coming on the television that's extremely misogynistic to the point of explaining how to sexually abuse women, and nobody in the room says, that's, that's ridiculous, that's just totally unacceptable. Or makes comment when it's dismissed as, that's just locker room banter, and says, look, I've been in locker rooms, that's not locker room banter then there's nothing supporting the work that's getting done in the schools. So you, you, we need to be changing that at all levels and, and have more men involved in bringing about the change so that they get, they're there as role models. Can I thank you for 
Yeah, the world is, a, in a sense, is really easy. It answer to the, how you change political culture, which is have, let's have more women, let's 50 50 and beyond. You know, and that might sound like a little bit of a kind of trite point, but um, you cannot be what you can't see. And if you don't see women in the chamber here and at Westminster, which it might be combative in that chamber, but good God, Westminster is absolutely horrific. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, credit where credit's due in terms of the way business is done here. Um, but you need to change the political culture and there needs to be more women coming through into the movement in every possible way. But there need to be more women MSPs. And I just need to second that because that was going to be where I was coming in is I'd like to see more women in politics um, and I'd like to see more political parties making an effort at ensuring that 50% of their candidates are women. Thank you. Um, can I thank the panel very much for coming along today? Uh, I think it's been a really interesting session. I just want to put on record that I am a member of Unison, as we've discussed so much about what trade unions can do and the role that they can play in, in, uh, in this area. Um, I thank Cheryl and Katie for uh, agreeing to provide the committee with some written evidence uh, to one of the questions. And we'll move into uh, or we'll adjourn for, uh, to allow the witnesses to, to leave.
Uh, agenda item three is for the committee to consider whether to accord recognition to the proposed cross-party group on shared parenting. And I'd like to invite uh, members to comment on the evidence they heard from Ivan McKee. Happy to support the creation of the group. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, those comments. So um, the group approves uh, the cross-party group of shared parenting and we now move into private session as previously agreed.